It's morning in eastern Washington. We are northeast of the Tri-Cities on the Empire Builder. And uh, today we're going to demonstrate the voyage in the other direction of how we came to the northeast. And uh, last night when I actually got on the train I was pretty tired so didn't take any footage of going back through Whitefish and it got dark pretty soon. So today it's a lot of this, and uh, eastern Washington it looks like this. Uh, very stark scenery, beautiful in its own way. Not all is everybody's uh, preference, but uh, I will be capturing what this looks like. And we are passing through a small town, which, one second. I thought that was the case, and I did check. That is Canal. I've been there before. Um, this is not showing the best side of that town. Um, there is more town-like parts to it. And as soon as we saw it, we are now gone. So it's pretty dry here, very arid, but with proper irrigation. Like in this field here, you can grow a lot of things in eastern Washington. This is Pasco. We came here on the way up. Um, this is a fresh air break. It's not very long. And uh, this is about what we're going to see of Pasco. And uh, it's still cool. Hasn't got hot yet today. But it's basically two minutes to stretch my legs because I do not want to get stuck in Pasco. No offense. I just came out of a cafe down the stairs. And we are apparently crossing the Columbia River already. So this is the Columbia River on the other side. Thank you. That is Oregon now. Um, not I-84 yet. That's a state smaller, smaller highway on the other side. So on the other side of the Columbia there, that is Oregon. That is Umatilla County. And to put that in perspective, once you go east out of the Dalles, you go through a pure, uh, an area where things are very arid. Um, there's not any... Uh, not a lot of towns of any size at all. And then you reach um, uh, Morrow and Umatilla County, which are have a little bit more rain and that there is some agriculture there. And a few towns of medium size with like a few tens of thousands of people. So right now that's what we're seeing. And then after we pass through that, then we'll go be going through um, the really dry zone a little bit to the west. And then we go to the Dalles and then things start getting in like Western Oregon. So over there on the other side of the Columbia River, that's Arlington. That's in Gillum County. And this county and the next county, Sherman County, both have a population of about 2,000 people. Um, they're in the rain shadow of the Cascades. So as you can see, there's no trees growing over there. And as you go further east, that rain shadow kind of dissipates and you get a little bit more rain. So, oh, well now we're, okay. That is the least populated part of Oregon. Um, and it's also interesting because I was like thinking, like this area probably gets about five inches a year of rain, maybe 10, um, but it is, would qualify as a desert, I believe. And you can see here you have the Columbia, which is a very wide river going through a, basically a desert. Um, and I'm trying to think of like, where else in the world does that happen? The Nile, the Indus, maybe the Huangho. So it gives you really, interesting ecosystem because there's all that water and everything around it is so dry. This is a long geological story but all of these cliffs were formed by what's called the Columbia River basalts. Um, eruption of well, one of the largest eruptions of its type in the history of the world just floods and floods of like a thousand feet of, of lava covering this area um, several tens of millions of years ago and uh, well, now a train is in our way. And this area has kind of a stark beauty to it, um, but it does get a little bit boring after a while. I mean, it's not as exciting as, you know, when you're going through the main part of the Columbia River Gorge. Also, a lot of times this view is being hidden by these berms. But uh, this is what the eastern side of the Columbia River Gorge looks like. This is a great site. It's 
a while in the distance, but there's Mount Hood. We're coming home. So right there, that's the John Day Dam, one of many dams on the Columbia River. <clears throat> so the Columbia River as we see it now, that's not how it naturally looks. It's naturally a lot rougher of a river, um, but it was dammed mostly in the 30s. Um, and there were native people for thousands of years of various ethnic and culture and language groups used the river as a source of fish. Um, and they still do, but obviously the way that salmon move up the river has changed a lot because of those dams. <clears throat> right there you can see some fishing platforms, which I believe are traditional. And there's more things like that along the river here. So already here the terrain is changing to a place that with ir irrigation, um, you can have orchards, and I imagine these are pears. Um, I know there are pears that are grown in this region, but I'm not sure about that. But some type of fruit tree. So here we're coming into Wish from Washington. Uh, a very small town and probably a train station for historical reasons because uh, not a lot of people live here, and it is the least used um, Amtrak station in Washington, um, which hopefully Miles will visit sometime soon. And this is also the point, um, you can actually get to Portland by local transit from here if you have a lot of time and want to. Um, and I've never been here before other than stopping on the train here in Wishram, Washington. So this is the Dalles Dam, another dam on the Columbia River. And if you look at the hills around the Dalles, you can see they're still mostly bare, although as you get into the city, you can see there's some probably irrigated ornamental trees. But right after we leave the Dalles, things will really start picking up um, as far as how much vegetation we'll see. The Dells is a town of about 10,000 people, historically important. Um, it's kind of the last town to the east where you're still kind of, you know, able to reach Portland easily on like a, maybe not day-to-day -day basis, but weekly basis or something like that. Um, and that people from Portland can take day trips to the Dells and vice versa without too much problem. And past there, then, you know, things really start changing. Um, so that's the Dalles, and like I said, like just right on the other side of the Dalles, you can see there's trees growing naturally without irrigation up on the hills here. So that's really the shifting point um, on the Columbia River Gorge. Very quick stop, we're just boarding a few passengers here. We'll continue on our way, Pigeon White Salmon, right now. So this is only at most a half hour, I think, after um, the Dalles. You can see they're not quite what they would be um, closer to Portland, but those are full of trees and timber lumber area. And this is white salmon, um, place that I've been through many times, really have not been to other than, you know, just visiting like I am now. So I wish I could see this through a cleaner and less glary window. Um, this is kind of the prime Columbia Gorge. Um, and on the Empire Builder, really this section along with, you know, the West Yellowstone area is the most scenic. But it's only about 30 miles. I mean, it, it, it's long for a day trip, but it's not gigantic. Window, I hope mm -hmm. you do enjoy that view. We might be stopped here for just a minute. We're waiting to get talked by a little situation going on on the rails. We just got some men and equipment working out on the tracks in front of us. Once again, just some men and equipment working out on the tracks in front of us. We're waiting to get talked on by it. And as soon as we do, we will continue on our way. Folks at this time, please enjoy the view that you have. Coming into this Washington section right here. Lots of beautiful trees and hills. And of course, you can't beat that view of that river right there. 
Also an interesting thing to notice here, I hope it's visible, those we waves are moving from west to east. And uh, of course the Columbia is flowing from east to west. Uh, so the wind is blowing in a direction opposite the river. And those waves look like they're moving pretty fast. So there's, there's some turbulence in this river right now. So the train has resumed motion. It is going kind of slowly. Uh, not that I should complain since it is going slowly through a place with a great view. I have been traveling for a couple days, so I'm, I'm getting kind of tired. There's the Bridge of the Gods, and through the trees on the other side of the river is Cascade Locks, um, one of many small communities along the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon, which we can't see because of all these trees. Looks like the tops of the mountains, the tops of the cliffs on the other side. Uh, looks like there's fire damage to the trees there, which is both a natural and unnatural part of the lives of trees in this region. Could have been the famous fire a couple years ago, started by fireworks. But we can't really see much now because of all these trees. So we're about to go into a tunnel. And this is the tunnel that kind of separates the Columbia River Gorge. When we get to the other side, we'll be basically in Washougal in the eastern suburbs of Vancouver. At that point, I'll probably just go back to my seat because... Um, she's explaining it. As you can see, um, you've also, the, the hills on the other side are getting shorter. Uh, we're kind of out of the main Columbia River Gorge. Great scenic thing. Um, for people going east, it's a little bit nicer because, you know, if it's the time of year where they can see it, it's a, when they're fresh. People who've come all the way from Chicago at this point, they probably just want to get off the train and aren't appreciating this as much as they could. Also, as you can see, there's a lot of trees. This is Washougal, um, eastmost city in the Vancouver metro area. When I was a year old, I lived here. I don't remember it uh, clearly, but I do have some fragmentary memories of being very young and living here, right next to the railroad tracks, in fact. So maybe that's why I'm here now. So that was Washougal, and uh, now we're continuing westward. Right now we're going through um, eastern neighborhoods of Vancouver and previously I made a video about um, like Forest Plain Boulevard, kind of the stereotype of the Couve and there are very um, pricey neighborhoods in Vancouver along the river and in some places you're going to just have to believe me because, okay now we can see more of them. So this is the uh, more expensive neighborhoods of Vancouver, uh, close to the river with the view of the river. No, so this is Vancouver. Obviously a place we've been many times, but this is what it looks like from the train coming in from the east. And you can see the new construction. Uh, they're kind of building up downtown Vancouver. We're coming to the train station in like two minutes. Oregon is next. In 
Keep them in line for the Empire Builder. Keep your feet. Thank you. So we're crossing the Columbia River back into Oregon. Um, and most of what I'll see from now is stuff I've obviously seen before and shown before. So probably won't have a lot of comments on it as I cross into Portland to end my trip, or at least the, the train part of the trip. Crossing the Willamette the first time today. I think I will be crossing it two more times after this, depending on what route the bus takes. So that's the St. John's Bridge, so getting into Portland. Not much else to say. Um, just getting ready to go home. Coming into Union Station. I have one line on my battery, um, but really past Portland, there's not a lot to report. I'm probably not gonna take any video of the bus ride because there's probably nothing going on at the two wallets and park and ride that anybody is interested in today. Um, yeah, so this is coming to Union Station. We're slowing down um, and just seeing what Portland looks like in the summer. A lot of these residential buildings, um, after we saw parts of Oregon, we were in Washington, but we saw across the river, we saw Gilliam and uh, Sherman counties, which I said both of those counties have around 2,000 people. And you can look at, like, how many people live in that building? Well, you can do the math. And so the Pearl District by itself, you know, would have a, you know, a similar amount of people to a lot of Eastern Oregon and some of these individual buildings might have uh, close to the same population as some of those counties we passed through. So it's it's a big uh, contrast that we've seen today between how, you know, stark Eastern Oregon is and then uh, looking at what the Pearl looks like.